Hello and welcome to another episode of the Oxford Online Maths Club. My name's James um, and I'm your host today. Um, quick shout out in chat, hi to George, hi to Ali. Um, Ali has asked a question that I've tried to answer, but it's about learning further maths, which I feel like some people in chat are currently doing. So if people have got suggestions about further maths in, in chat there as well. Hi to SV. Uh, hi to an anonymous person who just says the word gang, so goodness knows what that means. Hi to Arthur and Emma, and I think I saw another Emma as well, further down. Um, shout out to people who joined, uh, Tommy, Ross, Hannah, Athena, E are here as well, B I've just seen, uh, the, user with, the user with the username Matt Parker's back. Um, <laughs> there's multiple Matt Parkers in chat, hang on, let's just fix that. There we go, it's a little bit better, isn't it? Uh, hi to Gareth Southgate again. Uh, Rishi, I'm starting to recognise names, mostly, I suppose, because Gareth Southgate is a name I recognise anyway. Hi to another anonymous person. Um, I'm just doing shout-outs to the chat at the moment while people file through for another math session. If it's your first time joining us, um, hi, great to have you with us. Uh, welcome to the live stream. Um, we're going to do some maths in a minute. I hope that's all right. Um, if you want to join in with the live chat, uh, instead of using YouTube chat, where you've got to log in with your Google account or whatever, uh, we're using Slido. There's a link down there somewhere at the bottom of the screen for slido.com slash OOMC uh, where you can join in. You can set your username to your name if you want to, or you can be anonymous if you want to. And somebody's just asked a question about applied maths and theoretical physics. Let's find out what that, let's read what that question says. Uh, it's being slow on all of my screens. Uh, interested in applied maths. I'm interested in applied maths too. Um, which degree? Maths or physics? Since we don't do both, um, either's fine. Um, there's more physics in a maths degree, well more sort of applied maths in a maths degree than you might expect, uh, and also more mathematics in modern physics than you might expect, I suppose. Um, hi to Zach and Raphael and Georgia and Molly who says hello. Uh, hi to Charlie. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so uh, math and physics. Oxford does actually have a math and physics course, but here's the trick, it's only a, it's only a fourth year masters. So after doing three years of maths or physics, you can do this fourth year maths and physics combined thing as well. Um, uh, there's a question about uh, personal statements, which I don't know, hi to Olivia and Pehan. Um, another Matt Parker, you see the username's not quite distinct in, in the Slido chat, very nice. Good to see everyone here again. Hi to someone called Toast. Um, who I think might be another YouTuber if we're counting YouTubers in chat. <laughs> Hi to Eden. Um, so there's a question down there somewhere about uh, teaching yourself modules in further mathematics, which is something that some people do. That you know, there's uh, extra further maths content that other people are learning in further maths that you might not be learning in your particular bit of further mathematics. It's got a little bit more complicated recently since uh, modules change from being one sort of thing to a different sort of thing. Um, but broadly speaking, learning extra bits of maths is something I suppose I like to see, something I encourage uh, when encourage people to explore maths a bit more. It, it's not something that you have to do, if that makes sense. It's not the case that every, everybody does two further maths A-levels or something mad like that. Um, but there, there is out there further maths kind of revision resources or whatever on the web for other bits of further maths that you might not be learning in, in class. Um, those resources exist out there, so you might see stuff on, on the internet for other bits of maths. Um, I'm always encouraging people to look at other bits of maths, that's nice. Uh, right, yeah, he wants the probability that's coming home. <laughs> Sorry. The concept of Leonard Euler opening the door and shouting, Euler is in the house. It's just, that's what I needed this afternoon. Right, hi Mew, I'm good, thanks. Hi to the Ronkskian, uh, hi to Lena, SV again. Hopefully Numfar hasn't made a video about this topic as a reference to last week's video uh, where we did a whole live stream. It was almost entirely about a Numfar video. I suspect that there might be a considerable overlap, but I've got a twist again. So my plan with this one again is to talk about something that you might have heard of before, uh, but also have some sort of twist. That's whether we get to the twist at the end, that's whether this is distinguished or not from a uh, Numfar video, I think. There's a question about accepting Applying for Oxford DPhils, and I don't know the number off the top of my head, sorry, I don't know. Um, somebody misses Grant Sanderson. Any of us could be Grant Sanderson in chat. Okay, right, I'm really behind the chat. Hang on, let's catch up with chat. Uh, uh, Newcastle University offers a... F uh, somebody's in B is endorsing a, uh, a course by Newcastle University about A-level further maths. I don't know how you access that, and I don't know what it's like. <laughs> me, me approving chat messages is not an endorsement. <laughs> do, I need to, do I need to put that disclaimer on the screen somewhere? Uh... Georgia wants to know if it's bad to mention masterclasses done at specific universities. No, that's fine. Um, we don't 
you know, it would be really mean of a university to look at that and say, oh, it's not one of our masterclass, different masterclass. But okay, you're doing, you're doing extra bits of maths. That's great. Um, if, if, you've done, if you've done a masterclass with the University of Cambridge, it's fine. You can tell us about it on your Oxford application. We're not going to judge you. You're doing extra bits of maths. Uh, hi, Rebecca. Right, okay. I'm gonna, if I read out everyone's chat message, I'm going to never get onto the maths. And then we're never going to get onto the interesting bit at the end, which distinguishes this from a number of our video. Oh, right, okay. But interacting with chat is important, right? Uh, ah, Ross has got a question about square roots that I'm going to leave for chat. Um, chat, do that thing where you're really friendly and nice. Um, can you try and help with help with Ross's question? Oh, it's about transcendental numbers, which we haven't done on the live stream. So good luck, chat. I believe in you. Ross, if you don't get an answer, I'll come back later and answer it later. But we're going to find out if chat can help. Okay, right. Um, rather than me just reading out all of the things. Alex was one of the Matt Parkers, but there's now saturations. That's interesting. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Ah, somebody, somebody called Grant Sanderson, everyone would be pleased to know, has now logged in. Good. Um, okay, right, good. Okay, I've caught up with chat. Let's do the, um, let's do the coming up a bit uh, that we do at the start, okay? Uh, <laughs> You people haven't seen this bit before. I'm going to try and do an impression. Right, okay. Coming up this week on the Oxford Online Maths Club, James gets everything wrong and the suggestions about ways to make Formula One more exciting. Right, okay. Uh, that's the plan for today. <laughs> that's what we're going to try and cover. Um, I realise that my suggestions to make Formula One more exciting might be totally unnecessary and they might fall under the previous category of things that are entirely wrong. There was some chat before we li went live, there was some chat about what it means to get everything wrong. And I think people have spotted that there is a kind of logical paradox here that if I'm successful in failing at everything, if I get everything wrong, then this will have been right. Um, so if I get everything wrong, then I can't have got this wrong on this slide. And if I get this wrong on the slide, then I haven't got everything else wrong. So there's a kind of logical paradox already um, present on the slides. There's your maths content, I guess. <laughs> so so there, there we go. I've already failed. There's a meme which is like, uh, task failed successfully. Yes, no, that's a pop-up box. Right, anyway, okay. Imagine that meme now. Right, okay. Uh, <laughs> and people are going to put their own... Let's do let's do chat interaction as well throughout this. Um, Peter's put a suggestion. Peter, yes, put a suggestion of ways to make Formula One more exciting, which we can do, uh, and uh, we can also do, I suppose, other audience interaction. What's the what's the what other things have you got wrong in mathematics? I quite like the way sometimes because there's anonymous people, we can we can share mistakes that we've made before. What's what's things have have people other people got wrong? Right. And now we're talking about paradoxes. Uh, it is a bit math and philosophy, isn't it? Ooh, I kind of want Sakai back to talk about math and philosophy and like logical paradoxes. Right, okay, that's not the plan today though. Uh, as always, there is um, further reading posted on Friday on the Maths Club website. Um, <laughs> uh, on the Maths Club website, which is maths.orgs.uk slash r slash club. Um, Every Friday we post some follow-up material. Usually it's just things that we forgot to say on Thursday, uh, but sometimes extra content or bits and pieces, uh, links to other things on the internet sometimes for you to find out more about the topics if you're interested. Um, that's also now got an archive. Let's not call it archive, that sounds, archive sounds you know, old. Um, it's now got a collection of all of the previous episodes to stream on demand. Yeah, we made it sound cool. Uh, oh. Uh, Ross has rephrased the question, which has got some chat. Uh, has got some chat. Uh, Ross, I've approved your edited question, which is good. First line of a proof on a step question. I have I have an example of uh, getting things wrong on a step question. Uh, <laughs> and I want Lightning McQueen informed. What I've done here is a mistake. I wasn't keeping up with chat, and now I've encouraged chats to put interesting and funny things in chat, so I'm doomed. Never going to keep up. If you're joining for the first time, it's always like this. Um, if you're watching a previous episode from that archive of questions, then you can just like skip the first five, ten minutes. Um, oh, and I'm not calling it an archive. Uh, two mistakes which cancel each other out. I got the question right. Ah, sometimes minus signs are a bit like that. and uh, Sometimes minus signs don't work like that. Right, separate maths thing, I think. Um, so I'd like to start talking about the maths now, if that's all right. Um, it involves a personal anecdote, which I know some people hate. Um, when I was a kid, <laughs> it's a bad anecdote, but when I was a kid, um, I had this magic set, um, 
it was one of those like you buy a box and it's got some magic tricks in for kids. Um, and I remember most of the tricks involving uh, squashy foam balls and uh, don't giggle at that and uh, cups with false bottoms. Don't giggle at that. <laughs> and okay, it had lots of cups and balls and things moving around and uh, having uh, things disappear and reappear in different places. I can't quite remember how exciting it was as a magic box uh, collection. Um, but uh, there we go. Anyway, here's one of the props from the magic set I had as a kid. Um, the thing I remember at the ma about the magic trick is it involved three coloured pots or containers, which are the squares here, uh, and three coloured squashy foam balls. Um, I've put a blue one, a red one, and a yellow one, and then I remembered that some people uh, struggle to tell the difference between colours when I use them like that, so I've made the blue one stripy, the red one spotty, which makes it look like a mushroom, uh, and I've made the yellow one into a smiley face, which is sort of vaguely haunting me. As soon as I drew it, it you know, it's now my, like, nightmare, sort of, why is it so sinister? It's a smiley face, why is it staring at me? Right, anyway, okay, um, <laughs> here's the, here's the idea, um, you're supposed to put the balls into the boxes, um, now part of the magic trick, and I'm going to really struggle to remember how this trick works. Um, lots of them, the format was, you turn your backs, the audience member does something, you turn around, you tell them what's happened. Um, let's go to the interactive version of this. Have I got an interactive version of this? Ah, yes I do. Hang on, mild changeover. And then I do that, and now I'm in the interactive version where I can move things. Aha! Good, right, PowerPoint can't do this. Um, okay. And let's approve chat as well. Ah, people are also typing long messages, we're going nowhere fast. Um, uh, yes, good, okay. 1 minus 0 0.3 equals 0 0.3 is my favourite at the moment. Um, right, cool. Um, okay, so, uh, the idea of the magic trick was, I think, you ask someone from the audience to leave the cups and put the balls in there, uh, to put all of them, but they've all got to be in the wrong box. You have to get all of them wrong. Uh, so like uh, like this, right? So that was wrong. And then this one I'll put in here, and this one I'll put here, and now they're, they're all wrong. Um, the yellow ball's not in the yellow box, the blue ball's not in the blue box, red ball's not in the red box. Um, so that's, a, a, uh, that's a, an arrangement where nothing's in the right place, everything's wrong. Um, now, what I remember about the magic trick is that I think you then, start looking at some of them and deduce what's in the others. Uh, and so maybe I look in the first one, I see the yellow smiley face, and then with my magical powers of deduction, I'm able to say something about where the other balls are. Now, I can't remember what made that trick impressive because there's not actually that many ways to put the balls in the boxes wrong, with all of them wrong. Um, I think the audience probably spot that as they're trying to put the balls into the boxes to get all of them wrong, but there's not actually that many things you can do if you have to get all of them wrong. Hmm, okay, is that the one I had before? Maybe I should be taking notes. Uh, yeah, Zach in chat says, in fact, there's only two permutations, which I think is how my magic trick worked um, back as a child, that you'd check one and then see whether uh, which, which one of the two cases you were in. Let's try and work that out. So Zach claims that there's a uh, Zach claims that there's exactly two solutions. Let's line these up. I'm going to bring in some notation. I think always bringing in notation. Um, let's have a look. So let's call this B for blue, R for red, and Y for you will see this in your dreams tonight. Uh, then we can put the blue one. Now there are two possibilities. It's already looking like Zach might be right from these two possibilities of where to put the blue ball. I either put it in the middle, let's keep track of that, or we could put it in this third box. Can't put it in the first box because we're trying to get everything wrong. Uh, and now amazingly, um, if we're in this second case where we've put the blue ball over here, ah, if you chat joining in, yes, uh, you can put this one, you can't put it in here, so you have to put it over here. So there's only actually one possibility left over from there. Okay, so actually in that case where we put the blue ball over here was, it's fine, um, only one possibility. Okay, reset. Here's the other case. If I put the blue ball in the middle, then I can't put the smiley face ball 
in here, I've got to put it over there. There's a little step here where I suppose I'm I'm thinking about where to put the yellow ball. It's easy to get tricked by this problem and to think, oh, I should think about where to put the red ball. There are still two possibilities, but actually one of those possibilities leads to a problem down the line. Oh, I can't put the yellow ball in. So this kind of greedy, let's just try putting balls in different boxes and see what happens, you can end up with a, in a position where you get stuck. Okay, so I've got to put, got to put the red ball over here. A little bit of trial and error going on here, isn't there? Um, okay, amazing, good. Um, and someone in chat says that this is an example of something called uh, a... <laughs> Uh, someone just someone just joined in this their first time. What is going on? Oh, I wrote all of that stuff just off the side. You knew what it said though, right? <laughs> There's a blue case and a blue case over there. Oh, no. <laughs> the cropping got me. Right, okay. Um, exactly two possibilities. Someone in chat says that this is an example of something called derangements, which I suppose is our word of the day. Um, so a derangement is an arrangement, so arranging things in, into an order, but where everything is in the wrong place. It's not where it started. Um, every single item is in, in the wrong place. Okay, um, I quite like it as a word because it, it, it's a bit like arrangements, but it, it contains the kind of deranged idea. So deranged is also a word that can mean um, not arranged or kind of disordered and uh, crazy. Um, yeah, which is a joke that someone just put in chat. I'm really sorry, I stole your joke before I approved your chat message. Sorry, I do that. Um, good, okay. Finn's got a formula for them, which we're going to try and get towards. Um, I think my aim for the first bit of this, um, before the ad break, is to do something like, to work out if we've got more objects, then how many derangements are there? Uh, we've, seen, we've seen that with three objects, um, there are two derangements. I'd like to know for more objects. Um, I think Finn's put, yeah, Finn's put some sort of some sort of rule in here that we'd like to. I'd like to try and get towards. I'd like to explain kind of where that comes from. Um, I'm going to try and fit that in before the air break, and then after the air break, if you've already seen that problem, like I think Finn has, um, if you've already seen that problem, I've got a twist on it for afterwards that we can talk about afterwards. So hang around even through the bit that you've seen before, possibly in a number file video. Ah, number file. Right. Okay. Ah, yes. Two combinations, says an anonymous person. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. And people are still submitting their greatest mistakes with quite kind of a sort of exam focus at the moment, which is fine. Uh, let's do mine while people are sharing. Um, so during a... <laughs> is this therapy? No. Um, <laughs> during a, during an interview, um, I tried to simplify. So a maths interview for university. I had to simplify 5 to the power of 4 divided by 6 to the power of 4. And I simplified that in front of the interviewers by crossing out the fours and writing equals five over six. That is not true. <laughs> that was that was a big mistake and an important point of my mathematical past. Anyway, okay, let's back to back to derangements where we're getting everything wrong. Um, okay, uh, and I think I'm going to switch back to the slides. Now, an amazing mathematician would possibly have planned this a little bit better. Uh, can I switch back to the slide? Yes, I need to do this. And then I need to do ha, 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 this again. Right, cool. And we switched. We're back here in uninteractive world. Why did I make it like this? I could have done anything. Okay, so I'd like to try and talk about the case with more objects. Um... Why didn't I make a slide that said that? Anyway, um, and there's a there's a description on Wikipedia for this, if you want to rush ahead and look at Wikipedia, that I think is slightly not clear in a way. Um, I'm going to try and do my best to explain this, but in a slightly... I'm going to try and put more words in than Wikipedia puts in. It's often a way with Wikipedia explanations that Wikipedia is... Um, is quite high level in some in some ways. It's sort of ambiguous sometimes about what the what the level is of the reader. Um, okay, um, we are going somewhere with this. I have a I have a have a I have a I have an extension. I have a bit cool bit after the end break. We got to get there though. Um, oh, Olivia's mistake is great. That's sort of pro move. Right. Okay. 
Um, so here's the argument um, with more objects. And like how we looked at that one blue ball to start off with, in the case with three things just now, um, there's a, an argument that happens uh, in a kind of similar way for more objects. So if I've got lots of things uh, like this, and I have to derange all of them, so maybe I've got n objects where n is something huge, like 8. Um, OK, so maybe I've got n objects and I want to derange them. Then, OK, so this first object has to go to one of these n minus 1 places. So it has to go to, there are n minus 1 possibilities. OK, um, but all of those possibilities at the moment to me kind of look quite similar. I mean, these are different coloured balls that are going to go to different places, but I don't really care yet which one's which. Um, so here I've got like m n minus one possibilities, but at the moment I don't really care which one you point it to. Um, maybe it's maybe it's this one over here. I'm going to draw my pictures with it being that one over there. Okay, um, here's how it works. Um, the argument now splits into two possibilities or two different cases. So that's two different like uh, two different possibilities about what could happen next. Um, the first one I'm going to draw with uh, some sort of red arrow, I suppose. Um, the first possibility is that that, that object comes back. Uh, okay, so this object went over there, and wherever it was, that object then comes back and lands over here. Oh, a new person is here as well. Cool, hello. Uh, oh, and I'm getting behind my chat again. Ha ha ha. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, okay, so I could loop back again. Ooh, that's an exciting sym symmetry group comment that's just appeared in chat, which I'll talk about in a moment, if I remember to. Okay, um, so this is one case where maybe this object goes back and just takes the space of the, the previous object over there. That's, that would be good, because now they're, they're both deranged. Uh, so this, is, this gets a little happy face. Uh, both deranged. Uh, out of both out of position. Okay, uh, there's a different case where it goes somewhere else. Okay, so not a loop. I've drawn that one with a curved blue arrow. Okay, on the right. Um, so it goes somewhere else, not looping back to there. Okay, here's the argument now. Let's look at what, what, we'd, what we want to do in each case. Okay, so in the red case, where this object went over there, and then this object came back again, that, those are deranged, and they're, they're all set, and we can look at what's left over. What's left over is n minus 2 remaining objects. Uh, and we need to derange those. We need to look at all of the derangements of those m minus two objects. Okay, that's not too bad, because if we're working out these numbers, then that's related it to a previous value. Um, something like if we've got a sequence of these things, this is some sort of relationship between the number of derangements of n objects related back to a previous problem. So if I'm working them out in order, so I've deranged three things, and then I think about deranging four things, then when it comes to derange five things, look at all the derangements, um, then I can refer back to my working to see what the derangements of three objects were. I've agreed that two objects are going to swap, and I've got three left over. Okay. Uh, somebody in chat's just asked, are there any good match websites? Um, which we'll, we'll find out. Okay. Uh, cool, right, good. Um, okay, that's the first case. That one's a little bit easier to understand. So th if, this, if this object goes over somewhere, and that object comes back again, then we just need to derange the other n minus two objects. Um, the other case is a little bit harder, and it can feel like we want to split that into lots and lots of subcases to split up. Oh, maybe it goes there, and then we play the game over there, and then maybe it goes somewhere else. In fact, there's a clever trick that we can do that I'm going to try really hard to explain better than Wikipedia. Wish me luck. Um, okay, all we need to do, um, all we need to do is derange. 
the n minus one objects, not including the first. Just arrange these n minus one objects, which I'm going to uh, put some sort of box around, I guess. Just arrange these ones. Okay, now for each derangement of those objects, this ball, uh, or object, or whatever it was, is going to somewhere inside that green box. It's going to one of those places. It's not a loop. So this is one of those cases where um, everything's deranged, but everything's deranged, but um, this, this object here is, in particular, not going to the first one, um, which was the red case. So we've successfully isolated these two cases. Okay. Um, we're not quite done because I need to choose something. At the moment, <laughs> at the moment, I've got two things going here. Uh, two things going here. I've got the first object going there, and I've got, from my green box derangement, I've got something else going there as well. I need to fix that. Uh, uh, thing that's currently going here uh, actually goes to first thing. Okay, so I can fix it because if I just arrange the stuff in the green box, then I'll have something going to this position which I don't really want because I already thought that I'd want the first object outside the green box to go there. And I don't have anything going to the first op first place um, because I've just deranged inside the green box. But I can fix both of those things simultaneously by making sure that whatever it was I picked inside here that's going to this place to say, ah, no, instead, take that exact derangement, don't change anything else, take that exact derangement, but instead of going there, go off to the first op first place. You're special. You you picked you picked the one that was the same one that this outside object picked as well. So we need to fix that. Um, that's really good news because now I've changed that derangement of the green box into a derangement of the overall picture. In particular, a derangement where these two objects aren't in a loop because that one got deranged inside the green box. Um, that's really good news. That means that there are exactly n minus one derangements in this blue case. We're getting there, I think. Uh, oh, if n is multiple to it, right, okay, so people are suggesting other, while I wasn't looking at chat, chat suggested loads of clever things. Um, yeah, so chat suggested maybe we could have done them all in pairs. I think doing them all in pairs is part of the red case. The red case is quite clever. It says maybe you do a pair to start off with and then work on your derangement of the other n minus two object. And that might include some more pairs or, or it might not. We've got to count all of those possibilities where the first object is in a pair. Maybe it's the only pair, or maybe it's all in pairs. Um, so kind of that subcase is is kind of important in there. Okay. Um, so this is derangements. What a moment! I'm on a sentence over there. Derangements of n minus one in this case. Okay. Uh, number of arcs in a complete graph. Oh, so people are turning this into other questions in maths, which I love. Um, depending on which sorts of maths you want to think about. Um, Ellie's suggestion is. Um, number of arcs in a complete graph. So take the complete graph minus the number of objects. So let's think about that. So you've got a complete graph that has, a complete graph is one for every pair of objects. I guess maybe Ellie's thinking of that being a swap or a, it's kind of, a, you kind of want a direction, right? Because the, dire the, the, the derangement takes things from one place to another place. Um, so then minus the number of objects for subtracting the number yeah, I want to know how big the complete graph is, I think. Um, because the complete graph is, is that every combination of where it started and where it ended up, and then maybe with a direction? Because if I've got those those two in a loop, then that, that's a little bit different from having two in a different loop. Um, somebody earlier asked, asked about cycles in SN, um, and I think thinking about cycles can help if you already know some maths about how many cycles there are in SN. And I think most of the people watching don't know what SN is, so that's probably not a helpful thing for me to say right now. Um, sure, if you want to do symmetry groups on this, then mm, you can do some symmetry groups on this. I'm trying not to. Um, cool, okay. Ah, guess of a factorial there as well. 
Um, uh, da, 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 da. People have also said in chat, I saw someone say that Wolfram from math, math World is a little bit like this as well for tricky explanations. Anyway, okay, recap of what, what, what I've argued on this slide that's got very complicated and very colourful. Um, there are two separate cases. Um, once you've chosen where to move the first ball, there are, well, there are n minus one choices of where to do that. And once you've chosen that, there are two sub possibilities, two sub cases. Um, either the object just moves straight back to fill the gap that the first object left, in which case you still need to derange the other n minus two, uh, but those two are deranged, so you're good. Um, or if if you know that that object is not going to fill that slot, then what you can do, cheeky, is you can derange the n minus one objects in the green box and just move whichever one would have gone to that marked space, move that one to the first one. And because that's a derangement in the green box, it means that you, are, you aren't in the loop situation, so this is a separate case. Um, okay, uh, and the, so in that case, we're deranging the n-1 things in the green box. Um, this is a justification for the following formula. Um, so if I write, um, if I write a n for the number of derangements, ugh, spelling, uh, of n objects. So this is a sequence. Then a n is equal to uh, n minus one. So that's the cases for you have to choose where to put the first object. And then there are two sub cases inside here um, to multiply by. Either you swap the first ball back again and you look at the derangements on n minus two objects. So that's a n minus two for deranging n minus two things. Um, or you promise not to put the same objects back again and derange the things inside the green box, the n minus one objects there. And for every derangement inside there, you can convert that to a derangement of the overall n object by moving just that one object that would have gone to the same marked spot back to the start. Okay. That was a very long, complicated explanation of this formula, which turns out to be just, just enough to calculate them. Uh, so there you go, there's a, there's a re recur recurrence relation. I suppose you need a couple of numbers at the start. Um, I'll help out. So A3 we saw is equal to 2, um, and I need another one to get you going. Uh, maybe A2. Um, so if you've got two objects, then there's only one derangement, which is to swap them. So A2 is 1. A1 is 0, if that helps. I'm not sure if that helps. There's no way to derange one object. Um, there's no way to get the thing wrong if being correct is the only option. I wish being correct was the only option. Right, okay. Um, there are some, and then you can calculate some more. So, for example, A4 would be... So, 4 is N here. This would be 3 times uh, 2 plus 1. 2 plus 1 is 3, times 3 is 9. Um, so there are four derangements on th th so there are nine derangements on four objects. Um, maybe we could try and find them all. Okay, people like symmetry groups and recurrence relations is a little bit Fibonacci. It's a bit suspicious, uh, <laughs> like Fibonacci. And someone described my handwriting is deranged. So maybe that's another thing I got wrong. Oh dear, that e in particular. Where's it gone? Oh dear. Right. Okay. Um, that's the punchline for the first bit. Uh, there's a separate formula, which Finn put in chat that I might talk about after the break. Isn't it 3 times 2? Ooh. 3 times 2 plus 1, right? Oh, don't do this, Ross. Don't do this to me. <laughs> I have, if this gets 10 thumbs up, then it's going to be like, oh, I just can't multiply today. Oh, it's gone. Sorry, sorry, Ross. Right, okay. <laughs> the stream where everything is wrong. Okay, right, good. Um, okay. We've got a formula. That's good enough for me. I can work them out. There is some nice closed form, for, closed form, closed form formula that's on Wikipedia that I haven't haven't said. Um, okay, I'd like to do an ad break. I think um, here's my ad break. Uh, oh, our partners today are the inclusion exclusion principle, um, and they've presented us with the the following ad break. Um, it's about a survey. Um, there are some tick boxes for which pets people have. Um, they can tick multiple boxes. Um, and then we're going to look at some statistics from our survey. Um, here's the first question. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, here's the first question. Six people have a cat. Uh, four people tick the box to say they've got a dog. Um, one person ticks both boxes, and they've been included in the numbers above. Um, 
so here's the question how many people have a cat or a dog um do i just add the numbers together you know you have six people with cats four dogs add them up right what do i do um help me out in a chat do i do a poll for this oh, i should probably do a poll for this i can't really be bothered to do a poll for this um i'll just let people tell me in chat that'll be that'll be nice um i've got another one as well um uh, and now people are talking about is it three times right let's talk about this modification <laughs> Catherine's on Ross's team I think three times two plus three uh, I want to I wanna add together the previous ones and then multiply by n minus one so here when n is four I want to do three outside and I want to multiply that by the sum of the previous one and the one before the previous one was two the one before was one I definitely want two plus one inside here I'm going to multiply by three so it's three times three, which is nine. It sounds like quite a lot. I think it is actually nine. Um, okay, I'm going to stick with this. Okay. Um, aha! People want to do this one with Venn diagrams. Any fans of Venn diagrams in tonight? Uh, Venn diagrams. Oh, brilliant. Things I like. Venn diagrams. Oh. No, wait, that would be if I didn't like. No. Would that be if I didn't like Venn diagrams? If this was things I like and Venn diagrams? Well, things I like, maybe I label in the middle. How does this meme work? Anyway, right. Uh, uh, da, 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 Venn diagrams, six plus four plus one minus one. Ah, oh, yeah, people really like Venn diagrams. I've seen three people going for nine for this server. Yes, people have got that, it's nine. Um, there's this rule that some people learn at some point, I suppose, which is you can draw the Venn diagrams if you want to, uh, or you can just do six plus four minus one so we're subtracting one for this person because we double counted them when we did the adding uh if you just add them then that's a that's a good guess but hang on you've double counted the person who's got a cat and a dog um people are telling me in chat all oh, right okay okay yeah 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 yeah. okay good uh, maybe i shouldn't have said inclusion exclusion on the board um right i've got another one uh, with more numbers in. Hope you like numbers. Um, this one's harder to do with Venn diagrams and easier to do with counting. So that argument about I counted once, but oh wait, no, I double counted. So so fix it. Yes, Molly. Uh, yes, good. You have to subtract one for the overlap. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. That, that kind of overlap bit of your Venn diagram had size one. And if you just add the circles together, then you, you've double counted the bit on the inside. This is more complicated to think about with Venn diagrams. There are now, there's now cats, dogs, and fishes. Fish. Uh, and quite a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> Tommy wanted to do Venn diagrams as well. I should have filled the Venn diagram in. It was a little bit rude of me not to fill the Venn diagram in, right? It had one in the middle, and then I suppose five and three on the side. So that makes nine. Okay. Uh, Venn diagrams are Hannah's favourite thing. So this is like the best ad break ever, right? You, yeah, this is like... Great content for inclusion exclusion principle. Oh, brilliant. Um, there are some really cool Venn diagrams. I've seen pictures of Venn diagrams with more more than two or more than two or three things in. So that's nice. Uh, are we getting things wrong? Says anonymous. <laughs> Let's not. Um, we can never like. Um, uh, oh, what a suggestion. So some people who have seen the inclusion exclusion principle or quick maths. Oh my word, that's, that's actually the inclusion-exclusion principle in chat. I don't know how you've typed that. <laughs> I'm quite impressed. Okay, so let's point at chat. There's this formula that oh, I think is not really in A-level maths or anything like it anymore. Um, but some people see when they're learning to do sort of IMO maths or something like that, where you add together the sizes of things, then you subtract the intersections, and then you add the triple intersection. There's this rule for what you do. Um, you alternate between subtracting and adding at each level, and you have to go through all of the different combinations. Um, Tommy's still found Venn diagrams. Yeah, you can do some Venn diagrams on this one too. There's some hot takes about Venn diagrams. Oh yeah, what's the question? Sorry, the question is again, how many people... Oh, handwriting. Let's really focus on the handwriting. Have a cat or a dog or a fish. Okay. Yeah, spoilers, sorry. Numbers, right, cool. Uh, oh, and it was copy-pasted. Yeah, so it's not LaTeX, it's Unicode. <laughs> Unicode includes some math symbols. Um, I think, uh, was it Molly before, who had some keyboard that lets you type strange Unicode characters? 
I think some of them are in emoji as well, but not like the good ones, like integral sign. I think you need like a strange Unicode keyboard, or there's some websites to convert for you. We're also going to say they copy pasted it. Um, copy pasted the LaTeX and it worked. Uh, cool, right, good, okay. Uh, and George has worked out all the intersections. Yeah, uh, good. Oh, there's an integral sign. And there's a website where you can put, oh, Molly's put a link as well. Okay, right, just, just going to sort out chat, sorry. <laughs> uh, if you're on Linux, apparently, <laughs> it's a brief advert for Linux, you can type anything in Linux Unicode by using the compose key. <laughs> Which one's that? <laughs> um, oh, is that an integral emoji? No way is there actually an integral emoji. I was sort of joking. Oh, Windows logo. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Right, good, right. People are learning how to type maths. So we're doing, we're doing, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. John's put a joke. Somebody stole my username. Uh, what did they ask? They said something as well. Oh, does the principle work with four options? Yeah, I suppose we should, I suppose we should, I suppose we should learn it at some point. So there's a Venn diagram approach to this question where you want to work out how many people are in the Venn diagram overall. So you can work from the kind of inside outwards. So if this is cat, dog, fish, you can work from the inside outwards to say, well, there's five people right in the middle. And then we're told 20 people have a fish and a cat, and maybe some others. Fish and cat, and maybe some others would be the sum of these two bits. So there must be uh, 15 in here. Uh, and then keep working outwards, um, spiraling outwards in your Venn diagram, I guess, um, and, and get out to 185 people. Um, the inclusion exclusion principle thing that we read out from chat earlier is a sort of double counting approach again. Um, it says, First guess, just add together the big numbers for each of the big circles of the Venn diagram, each of the big, each of the big sets. That's my first guess. That's 250. Uh, that's wrong. Um, it's a stream where we get everything wrong. Um, but hey, first guess, right? Add together the number of cats, number of dogs, number of fish, 250. I'm doing great. Um, and then stop and think and say, oh, no, oh, dear. Um, what I did there was I double counted the people who have got a cat and a dog. Because uh, they were included in both of those at the top. Ah, oh dear. Right, okay. So I should subtract them. I counted them twice. I want to count them once. So I should subtract this number. Uh, and similarly, I should subtract this number and this number. Because I've double counted the dog and fish owners. The people who own dogs and fishes... Uh, I've double counted those in the first step. That big number, which I wrote down really excitedly. Uh, oh no, that double counted the dog and fish people. Uh, so I need to subtract there. Um, and then, that's still not correct, we're still wrong. Um, then you need to remember, sorry, boxes. Then you need to remember that, ah, no, some people might own a cat and a dog and a fish. And I've, uh, I've not counted them or double counted them. What have I done? Well, those people would have been counted three times in the first bit of calculation from being counted in the cat, dog, fish, each of those categories, then they would have been subtracted three times because they were included in all of these categories. So they got counted three times, then counted minus three times. So they've been not counted so far, which means I'm supposed to add the last number on to make sure that finally I actually count these people. Make sure that I've actually got them in my final answer. Um, the general formula says, Work um, work from the, I guess, biggest collections down um, and you alternate between adding and subtracting. So the logic behind the scenes there is a little bit complicated about why you're alternating between adding and subtracting. I haven't quite given you the entire story uh, of why this works out as all the overcounting and subtracting at each step. The thing that you actually do is you add at the start and then you subtract the next numbers for sets of two and then you add on any sets of three and then you would subtract the set four. If you had four, four, four categories, then you would start by adding them all together and then subtract the intersections of pairs and then add the intersections of three things. There's four different intersections of three things if you've got four categories and then subtract the quadruple intersection in the middle. Uh, DX math keyboard and we're learning, still learning about this. Ah, are there, Tommy's asked a good question. Are there any people who don't have cats, dogs or fish who did my survey? It's a good question. Um, there could be people out here outside the Venn diagram. And there could be loads of them, right? Because we haven't been told any numbers about this. Um, I suppose there could be some people. Let's say, if it makes you happy, let's say no. <laughs> let's say this was a pet survey where only people with pets did it. Uh, or if you want the kind of maths inclusion exclusion thing, 
Um, I'm just counting in my question, which I should have put on the slide. In my question on the slide now, I should have just just counted the people who have one or the other, or a cat or a dog or a fish. So these people, I'm not sure how many of them there are. We don't have enough information to know how many people there are out here. Their opinions are not interesting to me because they don't have any pets. And also they're not included in this question that we're asking at the bottom for people who have a cat, dog or fish. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, there was a good joke about vectors that I didn't read out. Uh, good. <laughs> People are doing good, good, okay. Oh, the, the anti-Venn diagrams opinions have started coming in. Um, a game I play involves four set Venn diagrams. Oh, is it set? Is it set? It's not the game called set, is it? <laughs> There's a game called set. Check the further reading. Um, it's not quite... Is it related? It's sort of a bit related. Anyway, right, good. Okay. Uh, can you draw Venn diagrams with circles? The answer is no. Um, you can't do one with four circles, I think. It's not super hard. It's not super hard to prove that you can't. Um, four, with four categories, uh, there are loads of regions that you should get, and you just can't get enough regions if you just use circles. Um, right. Oh, keep talking and nobody explodes. It's got, it's got Venn diagrams in it. Where are the Venn diagrams? I keep talking and nobody explodes. I've seen live streams of it, but not play. Anyway, right, maths. Okay, we've got to fix F1. We've only got 13 minutes, and we're going to fix F1. What levels did the fish do? It's just coming. Brilliant. Um, okay. Um, is this inclusion exclusion principle? I'll put a proper statement in the further reading. If I try and write it out here, it'll be really messy. It involves alternating, adding, and subtracting. Um, very quickly, uh, that gives us a nice formula for the derangements from before. Um, I think Finn put a nice formula up earlier, which was something like um, the final answer turns out to be n factorial. Oh, let's get this right. No, let's throw caution to the wind and get this wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't want to get this right. How does this work? Is it 1 minus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial minus 1 over 3 factorial plus dot 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 plus uh, minus 1 to the n over n factorial? Is that how it works? Is it something like that? There's a formula like that. If you do inclusion and exclusion on the idea of, well, if I want to get everything wrong, everything wrong, that's the same as n factorial minus at least one thing right. So n factorial for the overall number of permutations. Um, and if I haven't got everything wrong, then I've got at least one thing right. At least one thing right includes lo includes loads of this, this, or this, or this, or this, because it could be the first one that's right, or the second one that's right, or the third one, or multiple ones that are right. So there's some inclusion and exclusion in there. Have I got the minus signs wrong? Maybe I've got the minus signs wrong. Okay, no important formulas going in the further reading. Okay. Can you have Venn diagrams in more than two dimensions? This is a question nobody's ever asked me before. Brilliant. No idea. Could you draw them in more than two, two dimensions? I guess there's a question about intersections of spheres there. I quite boldly said something about intersections of circles and how many regions you can get. Maybe you can intersect spheres and have some fun intersecting spheres together. Feels like you probably can get away with that. If you go to enough dimensions, you can probably do enough Venn diagram stuff just by throwing a sphere in that takes some of the dimension or not. Uh, and Venn diagrams shouldn't even be called Venn diagrams. There's a maths fact. Um, cool. If I got it right, Finn says I've got it right. Amazing. Um, there's this result as a result of this expansion and using a bunch of maths that's kind of kind of year 13 maths, I suppose. Um, for large n, like 8, um, this is about 1 over e, which is about 37%, um, which leads to this amazing, amazing final answer that if you've got loads of objects and you shuffle them, the chance that all of them are in the wrong place is about 37%, um, which is just such a weird result, right? Um, 1 over e, you know, in the base of natural logarithms, totally belongs in this question. Okay, um, Flynn wants to know what the point is of a diagram that can't be rendered on a flat plane. And I think that sort of exploring is fun. We got a cool question about spheres out of that. What's the maximum number of regions that n spheres can uh, separate space into? What about in m dimensions? Cool. Um, Right, oh, Raphael's got a, a big claim <laughs> okay, for n dimensions. You see, chat's already having a go at that math problem. Um, 
And people are going to, oh, let's read out some chat. Uh, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there's a surprise factor of E. It comes from the expansion of, there's this nice expansion of 1 over E in terms of factorials that you learn at some point in A level, but hey, right. Okay. Yeah, if somebody wants to do a one dimensional, somebody wants to do a one dimensional Venn diagram just for fun, just to see what happens. It's just that, right? Anyway, okay. Um, good. Um, here's my plan for making Formula One more exciting. Quick review of Formula One for people who haven't been following Formula One. Um, there are 20 drivers. Um, they're in 10 teams of two, uh, and each team of two supplies two cars for the drivers to drive. Uh, and it's quite boring in that the drivers drive for that team and they drive those cars in every single race. Uh, some of the cars are better than other cars. Hot take. Um, some of the cars are better than other cars, um, and it's always the drivers on that team who get to drive those cars. Um, maybe it would be more exciting if we did one of these derangements. Um, here's my plan. Do a derangement. Shuffle all the drivers. Um, now I don't want the driver to get back to driving their own car, so I want them to do, do this derangement where they shuffle. Uh, can't remember what the link to E was at the beginning of its day. I'm going to put it in the further reading. That series that we had from Finn's um, expansion from Inclusion Exclusion, that series is uh, secretly a series that involves 1 over E. I'm going to put a thing in the further reading tomorrow. Okay. Ooh, sparkles. Uh, <laughs> uh, Rishi's been to an F1. Oh, amazing. Okay. Expand F1 to more dimensions. There we go. Um, right. Okay. Do a derangement. Shuffle them all around. Right. Problem with this is that some of the drivers... If I just do a derangement, some of the drivers might end up in their teammate's car. Uh, let's try and draw that very quickly. So if I've got the cars um, in the kind of pairs for the teams, then maybe the derangement does something like this. Um, so that some people end up in their teammate's car. Um, and the cars are kind of identical. The drivers are different, but the cars are kind of identical. So this sort of derangement... It's quite a strange derangement. Um, this this sort of derangement is kind of not not maximally exciting. Oh yeah, is this useful for Secret Santa? Maybe. <laughs> um, Secret Santa also wants derangements. Um, this is like Secret Santa where you've got um, couples who shouldn't be given each other in the in the Secret Santa. They should be given someone from a different team. Um, okay. Um, so this is a more complicated problem because now I want to derange. And I want to make sure that Lewis Hamilton doesn't get Valtteri Bottas's car. Because that would be an advantage. Um, Lewis Hamilton, I want to give one of the, the other 18 cars. Uh, and the combinations there are, are, are really difficult. Um, I did wonder whether we could explore versions of this problem. Um, yeah, the idea is that we find out whether drivers in different cars do well. Or drivers from some teams do, do better in different cars. Uh, <laughs> da, 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 da. Um... Do we learn about expansion of exponentials in further maths? Yes, should do. There's a really nice series. It's going to be in the further reading tomorrow, so you will learn it tomorrow if you check the maths website, um, or probably in further maths at some point. Uh, okay. Um, da, 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 da. Good, right, cool. Okay. Um, there are different versions of this problem, just thinking a little bit about time. Um, the problem with 20 drivers is really difficult. Here's a quick description of that problem. I'm going to call these double derangements, I think. I want to shuffle all 20 drivers, so it's 10 teams of two. I want every driver to end up not in their car and not in their teammate's car. Um, how many permutations are there? Um, this problem's quite hard because the numbers are quite large. Also because the previous logic that we had about different cases gets very complicated because you need to worry about whether the other people are going to be shuffled or not inside their inside their car, uh, inside their teams. Um, I thought we could think about some smaller cases. Um, if we've just got two teams instead, I don't really know if this is going to be helpful or not, but if we've just got two teams, uh, let's put some drivers in. Uh, let's quickly draw some drivers. So we've got maybe the red team, and they've got a uh, stripy driver and spotty driver, uh, and maybe we've got the blue team. I've suddenly suddenly become agnostic on what the what the teams are called. Uh, red team and blue team, uh, who are bitter rivals. Um, how can we derange those? Now, I, I don't want the red team to end up in. I don't want either of them to end up in the other red car, uh, and I don't want either of the blue team over there 
to end up in either blue car. I need arrangements are there in that case? Double derangements is a good yeah. Double derangements is a good it's a good name for a thing, isn't it? Uh, like it could also mean the problem is it could also mean a derangement followed by another derangement, which then could get you back to not being deranged. So uh, who knows? Um, doubly deranged drivers. Okay. Uh, what are we gonna do? Uh, are the I so identical cars are interchangeable, um, but let's just keep them lined up like that. I suppose. Um, I suppose I'm thinking about sending the drivers to a team. So rather than I guess there's two seats in this two seats in this team, but I I don't mind. Yeah, I get. I guess I'm considering the cars to be identical. So once the once the red spot drivers been sent over there, um, or no, maybe am I? No, I'm not. No, sorry, I don't want that. I want the cars. I want the cars lined up on the grid. Mm, yeah, okay. There's a technical difference here, isn't there? I want the cars lined up on the grid, two from each team. And then I'm going to send the drivers to the cars, and I want them to end up in, in different cars. So then the cars, the cars are different. <laughs> so I'm going to count the permutations where you send the drivers to, maybe you send this red spot driver here, or you send them to that seat. And I'm going to count those as different. Um, right. Okay. Let's try and count what I mean. Um, so in this case, both blue drivers have to be over here. But they could be sitting like this, or they could be sitting like this. Um, and the red drivers have to go over to the other team, because they're not allowed to be in this team. They could be sitting like this, or they could be sitting like this. I'm going to consider those to be different, I think. I'm trying to remember what's on my next slide, and remember how I set this problem up. Okay. Yeah, okay, so two permutations. So I've got four possibilities on board. Yeah, Catherine's got, okay. Other people have got four. Okay, right. <laughs> I, I, I think I've described my problem. Um, yeah, okay, four permutations of two cars. Joanna agrees as well. Okay, right. I think I've got my four case over. With three teams, it's much more complicated. <laughs> um, I suppose with three teams, I could look at all six factorial shuffles and decide whether it works or not. Um, that was too boring for me, so I gave it to my computer. Um, and in fact, I gave my computer the problem with 20 of them and told us to just like guess a lot. Uh, just try some random permutations and check. That thing that I said before about, you know, for the um, for the derangements, if you try a big number and you just shuffle, then see what happens. Um, there's some probability going on there. Um, but there is an exact answer to this question for, for 20 drivers. Um, and I found it in a paper uh, called Derangements and Laguerre Polynomials, which is a great name for a paper. Derangements are this pure maths thing. Uh, Laguerre polynomials are particular polynomials that have applications in applied maths. So why they're working together here is a really tricky thing. Um, it's by two mathematicians um, whose names I did go and look up. Uh, Joseph Gillis on the right there. Um, and then the other mathematician on the left, they're slightly harder to look up, partly because their surname is Even. So if you Google even mathematician, then you can imagine how that works. Um, also, their, their initial is S. So when I Googled S even mathematician, Google said, did you mean seven mathematician? And I didn't. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Shimon, uh, Shimon uh, even uh, from the Department of Applied Maths there. Uh, Shimon's got a long list of papers on their website, which doesn't include this one. So I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it's Shimon even and Joseph Gillis. Um, wrote this paper, combining together um, derangements and Legapol polynomials, not for Formula One, but for the general problem where you've got teams of different sizes, perhaps, and with different numbers. You've got different sets of uh, things that you would like to be deranged so they don't end up in that set. So maybe there's a large set and a small set and some other ones as well. Um, they have this amazing notation, which is P for the permutations, subscript N1, N2, NK. Um, so there's loads of subscripts going on there for the different sizes of the different sets of things that they want to shuffle. Um, anyway, I'm not sure what's um, I'm not sure what's more um, brilliant. The the answer to the Formula One problem turns out to have a brilliant answer. Um, the number of derangements is given by this integral. I know <laughs> that's the answer to the Formula One problem. It's not obvious that that's a whole number when you look at it. Um, and perhaps it's even more surprising that it's this number, 312 quadrillion, 426 trillion, 715 billion, 251 million, 262,464, which is quite a lot. 
<laughs> but hey, it's this uh, maths paper that goes through and it gives a nice formula for every possible case in terms of these strange polynomials. There's just some integral that you do that involves E again um, as a special case. Um, if all of the teams only have one car, this turns back into the original derangements problem. Uh, and then E is, is just in their formula there. So maybe it's not surprising if you know their formula that E comes out of this problem. But look at this. Isn't this crazy? Um, that works out, by the way, that's pretty big. Um, if you shuffle the drivers at random, then the probability of success here, the probability that you give everyone to a different team, is about 12.84%, uh, which is... Uh, also what I got by doing some small simulations, but hey, there's an exact number. I think I'm going to finish on that one. Um, so <laughs> uh, that, yeah, so all math questions should be set in the context of Formula One. Um, I think there's a YouTube video in this. I don't think Numberphile's done this one. Um, that's a cool number. That's a cool uh, integral. It's no obvious link between the integral and the maths question. Number theory is just like that sometimes, I guess. Right, okay, uh, let's have a quick look at chat. Uh, it's got to be a number, but a whole number? It could have been, could have been a fraction, right? Or something involving E? But no, it's just that big number. <laughs> there it is. Those are all its digits, and then it stops. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe once you've done a few of these integrals like this, maybe you spot they're all whole numbers for some good reason. Uh, does this work for other numbers? Yeah. Uh, if you want a different number of teams, uh, then you change this number up here. Um, if your teams are different sizes, if you've got some teams that are teams of two and some teams that, that are entering three cars or four, um, then you need different polynomials in here. Uh, so 10 is for the teams and you do different polynomials for different sizes. Um, the polynomials are called Laguerre polynomials and you just look them up in a, a list of Laguerre polynomials. <laughs> There's a generating expression for Laguerre polynomials as well to link back to something we had before. Okay, um, but I think that's my last slide because I think I wanted to end on that number. Um, kind of with the idea here that there are links between these counting problems and lots of other bits of mathematics um, and lots of different approaches to doing similar sorts of problems. Um, so if you're trying one sort of approach where maybe you think about some cases, there might be a different approach where you think maybe more holistically about including and excluding things. Um, their proof does work a little bit like including and excluding things on the way through. Uh, right, okay. Uh, oh, I've got Molly's fun maths fact of the week, which I'm going to read out very quickly. Uh, Marcus Soto used to play football uh, for Hackney, uh, and all the players played in prime number shirts, which he said in an RI Christmas lecture, which we can all go and look up afterwards. Right, okay, I'm going to talk to uh, talk to chat for a bit after we after we go live because there's still people talking in chat, uh, but I'm going to turn off the live stream. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in 167 hours for the last episode of this season of the Oxford Online Maths Club. See you in 167 hours. Take care. Bye.